Today's video is once again kindly sponsored by one of our long-term partnerships, Babbel, which is by far my favourite language learning app. Babbel is the best app in the market right now and it provides award-winning courses in the likes of Spanish, French, German, Italian and many more. I've been learning Spanish since I was in my teens and I have an ultimate goal of becoming fluent in the language as well as travelling to Spanish-speaking countries. To reach my goal of being fluent, I have been using Babbel every day, learning through various listening, reading, writing and speaking tasks. Aside from Spanish, I have been learning Italian and Scandinavian languages on Babbel. Learning a new language is great fun, whether you are learning alone or with family. Plus, being bilingual is one of the most desirable skills for many occupations. What I personally love about the Babbel app is that, unlike other language learning apps, the courses have been created by genuine speakers of the languages and don't run via an algorithm or computer-generated material. And furthermore, the course contents prepares a learner for real-life situations. Another huge bonus is that there are no adverts and you can learn offline as well. Doing just 10 or 15 minutes of Babbel per day will get you speaking a new language within a matter of weeks and it helps improve your cognitive skills and your memory. The last few months have seen Babbel add very exciting new additions to the app, including Babbel Live. Babbel Live lets you add live classes with certified teachers to your existing subscription for an additional fee. And you can even subscribe to Babbel Live as a standalone product. There are also brand new features such as short stories, a podcast and culture clips. Head to the link in the description below to buy six months and get six months free on a Babbel subscription. Thank you once again to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. On the 1st of December 1948, at approximately 6.30am, a man named John Lyons and two men who were riding their horses along Somerton Beach, located near Glenelg in southwest Australia, discovered the body of a man, his head resting on the sea wall, with his feet crossed and pointing towards the sea, his left arm in a straight position, whereas his right arm was bent. The man, who soon became known as the Somerton Man, had an unlit cigarette placed behind his ear and a half-smoked cigarette was on the right collar of his coat, held in position by his cheek. It appeared likely that the man had been smoking the cigarette when he died, seemingly in his sleep. Police arrived at the beach shortly afterwards, it being located across from the crippled children's home, which was on the corner of the Esplanade and Bickford Terrace. They noted that no disturbances had been made to the body, and they couldn't find any external signs which could indicate how he passed away. His death did not seem suspicious. The man's body was subsequently taken to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, where he was officially declared deceased at 7.45am, though the pathology report states that the man had died likely between midnight and 2am. Found within the man's jacket pockets were a number of interesting items. An unused second-class rail ticket bought on the 30th of November 1948, the 10.45am service travelling from Adelaide to Henley Beach. A $7 bus ticket from St Leonard's in the city to North Terrace, located 1.8 miles north of Somerton Beach. Sources conflict on whether the ticket had been used or not. The next bus would have departed around 11.15am, half an hour after the train arrived. An American comb made from aluminium, a plastic comb, a 
half empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette packet containing Kensita's cigarettes, and a quarter full box of Bryant and May matches. The male individual was described in the pathology report as being of Caucasian origins with a quote, British appearance. It is believed that the man was aged somewhere between 40 and 45 years of age, meaning he would have been born around 1905. The unknown man stood at 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighed around 176 pounds. He was in very good physical condition and notably had very broad shoulders with a narrow waist and his hands showed no signs of manual labour. His eyes were grey and his hair was mousy grey with fair and ginger flecks throughout, greying on the sides, as well as behind the ears and around his temples. His hair was combed back and it was noted in the pathology report that the backward combing, rather than having a parting, might have been crucial in identifying him, as backward combing was a popular American practice, whereas a side parting was deemed to be a more popular British practice. The unidentified man had very distinguishing features, including very pronounced calf muscles, and his larger and smaller toes met in a wedge shape. This indicated that the man wore boots or high-heeled shoes, possibly suggesting that he may have been a dancer at some point during his life. The Somerton man also had three small scars, one inside his left wrist, one curved scar inside his left elbow about an inch in length, and one scar or burn mark about an inch in size on his upper left forearm. His fingers also showed tobacco stains, indicating that the man was a heavy smoker. When the Somerton man was found, he was wearing a white shirt with a US striped red-white-blue tie, a brown knitted v-neck pullover, a light brown and grey double-breasted jacket with feathered stitching, a practice only done in the US at the time, a pair of brown trousers, brown socks, a tailored brown brogue shoes containing the cobbler numbers 206B on the inside leather. The man's body was entirely clean-shaven and all of his clothing tags had been removed, which seemed rather odd. Quite unusual for the time, the man did not have a wallet in his possession nor any other form of identification, and because of this, authorities concluded that the man had committed suicide. Authorities ran the man's dental records through their systems to find a match, however, to no avail. He was notably missing several teeth, which experts concluded was hypodontia. The pathology report interestingly revealed that the victim had an abnormally large spleen, three times larger than usual, and yet his heart was perfectly normal in size. He had blood mixed with the food in his stomach, both kidneys were congested, his liver contained an excess of blood in its vessels, and small vessels in his brain were also congested. Alongside the congestion of the liver, spleen and brain, the man had suffered from an acute gastritis haemorrhage. Following examination of his stomach contents, it was concluded that the unidentified man had eaten a potato pasty around three to four hours prior to his death. However, no foreign substances were found in his body which could explain his strange death. An untraceable poison was the most likely cause of death, however the pasty itself was ruled out as the source of the poison. Rather oddly, no vomit was present at the scene, which goes against the poison theory, as his body would have naturally tried to get rid of any toxic substances that had been ingested. After the strange death of the Somerton man spread across the media in Australia, various witnesses came forward, stating that on the evening of the 30th of November, the night prior to the man's body being found, that they had seen an individual that resembled the decedent lying against the seawall in the exact same position that he was later found in the following morning. A couple who saw the man at around 7pm noted that they saw him extend his right arm to its fullest extent, only for it to fall limp. This could perhaps have been a last convulsion before death. 
Another couple who witnessed the man between 7.30pm and 8pm told authorities that they didn't see the man move at all when he was in view, although they did believe that the man had changed position ever so slightly. The couple thought nothing of this, although they did find it odd that he was not reacting to the vast amount of mosquitoes. Between themselves, the couple concluded that the man was either drunk or had fallen asleep and went on home. Interestingly, in 1959, a witness came forward and reported that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man along Somerton Beach the night before the body was found. But whether this was purely a coincidence or whether one of these men were the Somerton man remains to be seen. As time progressed, this case took some very intriguing twists and turns which left police scratching their heads. On the 14th of January 1949, staff at the Adelaide railway station discovered an unlocked brown suitcase. The suitcase had been checked into the railway station's left cloakroom sometime after 11am on the 30th of November 1948, and authorities believed that the suitcase and its contents belonged to the Somerton man. Within the pristine case was a red checked dressing gown, a size 7, red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underwear, a pair of pyjamas, a tartan scarf, shaving items including a strop with Kent St Sydney written in the leather, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs and a sixpence in a pocket which had actually fallen out when the investigators emptied the case an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short, sharp instrument, two pairs of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush, commonly used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. A lady's hairpin, kiwi brand boot polish, a soap dish, a toothbrush, toothpaste, a small glass dish, a loop magnifying glass, three pencils, a pencil sharpener and a number of blank prepaid letter cards were also found inside the suitcase, as was a thread card of Barber brand orange waxed thread, noted in the pathology report as warm sepia of Ridgeway, a thread not actually sold in Australia at the time. They were also only available as military issue at the time, distributed in so-called housewife packs containing threads and utensils to sew. According to the official pathology report, a similar orange thread was found on the buttons of the Somerton man's trousers he was found wearing, and some barley grass was found on a lower trouser leg in the suitcase, as well as on the man's socks. The evidence seemed to indicate that the suitcase did indeed belong to the unknown man. Police interestingly found the name Keen and T. Keen on a tie, a laundry bag and a singlet, which they investigated in a bid to identify the victim. However, their efforts were fruitless. They could not find any reports of a missing person in Australia or abroad bearing the name Keen. It is possible, however, that since rationing was still in place at the time following World War II, that the clothes could have been borrowed or donated by a charity. An inquest into the unknown man's death was conducted in June 1949, during which a number of significant pieces of information came to light. The medical examiner found that the man's shoes were very clean, which was unusual if he had supposedly been walking around the Glenelg area all day. Had he perhaps changed his shoes prior to visiting the beach? Or did the men seen carrying a man place him on the beach with his shoes having never touched the sand? This led the medical examiner to question whether the man necessarily died where he was found, a theory which is also backed up by the lack of vomiting and convulsions that is caused by the effects of poisoning. It was testified by a pharmacology professor that two specific drugs named as Digitalis and Uwabine could have been taken as they are extremely toxic in very small doses and it would have been almost impossible to identify the drugs in the human body, even if a larger dose had been taken more than seven hours before his body was found. Despite extensive investigations, medical examiners have never been able to determine the Somerton man's cause of death. 
As the inquest was taking place, another piece of substantial evidence was found that simply baffled the Australian authorities. A small rolled up piece of paper with the words Tamam Should printed on it was found in a fob pocket sewn within the Somerton man's trouser pocket. The phrase was translated from Persian, meaning ended or finished, and it was found on the final page of the Rabayat of Omar Khayyam, a book of 11th century Persian poems that's themes revolve around living life to the fullest with no regrets when it ends. Police conducted an Australian-wide search to find a copy of the book that Tamam should had been torn from and eventually found its owner. The owner of the book, who has never been publicly identified, had allegedly seen an article in the previous day's newspaper which made him wonder if the piece of paper was from his copy and, alas, it was. According to statements by police, the book was found in the rear footwell of an unlocked utility vehicle which was parked on Jetty Road, Glenelg, shortly after the discovery of the body on Somerton Beach. On the inside back cover of the book, detectives found strange handwritten inscriptions, including a telephone number, an unidentified number and five lines of text that resembled some kind of encrypted message, a message which has never been deciphered. The phone number was found to have belonged to a nurse called Jessica Ellen Jo Harkness Thompson, a resident of Glenelg who lived a short distance away from Somerton Beach. She was interviewed by police, however she claimed that she did not know who the unknown man was or why he would have her phone number. She did tell police, however, that an unidentified male had attempted to visit her in late 1948 and he had questioned neighbours about her. However, Joe was very evasive when questioned further about him. Interestingly, after seeing the plaster cast taken of the Somerton man, Joe seemed, quote, taken aback and according to various reports, almost looked like she was going to faint, avoiding looking at the cast more than once. Something else interestingly to note is that Jo had previously owned her own copy of the Rabiot and in 1945 gave it to an army lieutenant called Alf Boxall. They lost contact after 1945 and because of this, Jo allegedly thought the Somerton man may have been Alf. However, in July 1949, Boxall was found alive and well in Sydney and still had Jo's copy of the Rabiot in his possession fully intact, with the words Tamam Shud still in place. Many believe that Jo Thompson knew the identity of the Somerton man, however, she passed away in 2007. Interestingly though, Thompson's own daughter, Kate, believes that her mother did know the Somerton man's identity, with her claiming that his identity was, quote, known to a level higher than the police force. Over the years, many have speculated that due to the bizarre nature of this case that the Somerton man may have been involved in espionage and Kate believes that her own mother may have also been a spy. Jo Thompson taught English to migrants, had a strong interest in communism and can speak Russian, although she never disclosed to her daughter where or why she had learned the Russian language. The spy theory leaves a lot up for debate and despite it being quite far-fetched, it is entirely plausible. The body of the Somerton man was embalmed on the 10th of December 1948 after the police were unable to identify him, something which Australian authorities had never done before. In early 1949, the unknown man was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery where a service was conducted by the Salvation Army. The South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save the unidentified man from a pauper's grave. Years after the burial, flowers began appearing on the unknown man's grave, but it is a mystery as to who kept placing the flowers there. Perhaps someone who knew the true identity of the man, such as Joe Thompson, or perhaps just someone who felt sorry for the man whose name was unknown. Over the years, various pieces of evidence have been lost or destroyed, such as the suitcase and its contents, and even some witness statements. Police do, however, still have the man's DNA, fingerprints and dental records on file. 
After a large number of false positive identifications over the years, some hope came in October of 2011 when a woman from Adelaide contacted an anthropologist about an ID card belonging to an H.C. Reynolds which was found in her late father's possessions. Upon comparing both photos of the Somerton man and H.C. Reynolds, the resemblance was quite something, especially in the eyes, lips and nose, but more so the ears strongly resembled the Somerton man. The ID card, which was numbered 58757, was issued within the United States on the 28th of February 1918 to H.C. Reynolds, listing his nationality as British and his age as 18. Searches were conducted in Australia and the UK, however no records for an H.C. Reynolds could be found. Some researchers believe H.C. Reynolds to be a Tasmanian man named Horace Charles Reynolds who died in 1953, however it is unconfirmed if this is the same man in question. It is also a complete mystery as to why the ID card was kept by the Adelaide woman's father. Another interesting point is that, according to Professor Derek Abbott, who independently investigated the case in 2009, he managed to obtain a photograph of Joe Thompson's son, Robin, who was born the year before the Somerton man died. As previously mentioned, the Somerton man had hypodontia, a rare genetic disorder of both lateral incisors, and his ear shape was extremely unique. His upper ear hollow was larger than his lower ear hollow, which is a feature carried by only 1-2% to of the Caucasian population. Robin Thompson also appeared to have the exact same unique ear shape as the Somerton man and had hypodontia, the chance of this being a coincidence being 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. Robin took part in ballet classes in his younger years, just as experts believe the Somerton man did. Is there a possibility that Robin could have been the Somerton man's child? DNA has never been taken as authorities refuse to exhume Robin's remains to simply satisfy scientific or public curiosity. Mitochondrial DNA belonging to the Somerton man, which was found embedded in his plaster cast death mask, was analysed in February 2018 at the University of Adelaide. Their findings were that the Somerton man and his mother belonged to haplogroup H4A1A1A, which is possessed by only 1% of Europeans. The following year, in October 2019, it was announced that the South Australian government granted conditional approval to have the Somerton man exhumed, with interested parties being the ones to cover the costs of the exhumation and subsequent DNA analysis. The exhumation was subsequently approved in April of 2021, meaning that we may soon find out the true identity of the Somerton man. His DNA will be compared to his potential grandchild, Rachel Egan, who is incidentally married to Professor Derek Abbott, who has dedicated so much of his time to researching the Somerton man's case. In early October 2020, a virtual reality specialist from Canada, Daniel Vosart, joined forces with Derek Abbott and forensic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick, who co-founded the DNA Doe Project. Their aim was to create a new artistic rendering of what the Somerton man would have looked like in life. Using artificial intelligence, Daniel managed to create an animation of the Somerton man's face and conjured up several new facial reconstruction images by using post-mortem images and the plaster cast. With these new images and more advances in technology, investigators are hoping for that long-awaited breakthrough in this case. 73 years after being discovered, the Somerton man still remains nameless. This case is on the cusp of being solved, though so many questions still remain unanswered. Was he involved in espionage? Did he and Joe Thompson know each other? Was Robin his child? How did he die? By his own hand or by another? Ultimately, the most important question still remains. Who is the Somerton Man? Thank you.